Well, welcome everyone, and I apologize for the kind of the slight problems we were having with our audio-visual setup here initially. Uh, but we're so fortunate today to have with us uh, one of our board members and a renowned author, historian, uh, and just an all-around great guy, uh, Flint Whitlock, who's going to be our speaker today. Uh, Flint served in the Army and in Vietnam, and uh, post beyond that has had a quite an illustrious career to include being editor for World War II Quarterly magazine. Uh, any place you go in our museum today, you'll see examples of Flint's work and contributions to us. So we certainly hope you'll uh, join us uh, afterwards, maybe visit with Flint with appropriate distancing, uh, enjoy our, our coffee and donuts, help us. We have more than enough. Uh, and visit within the museum. Uh, unfortunately, I had some slides I wanted to show which talks about our upcoming uh, talks. Uh, we will have that posted on our website. Uh, but f uh, our next one, which really is going to be quite a marvelous uh, event, will be on 10 October over at the Broomfield Auditorium. Uh, and this will be a, a combination of two speakers uh, giving a presentation, Colleen Sawyer and Shirley Jamel. And both of them are having a presentation that's quite timely related to World War II, and particularly uh, how individuals uh, contributed to that, both back in the US and uh, in France. Uh, we will have more information about that. Seating is limited uh, to about 40 people over there. We will stream it, uh, and you will be able to reserve tickets for that. We are asking for a contribution of $5 uh, if you uh, attend that. So again, without further ado, uh, Flint, please come up. Thank you again. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me back there all right? Uh, this is the first time I've, I've talked to a lot of very diverse groups, but this is the first time I've ever talked to a whole room full of bank robbers. So uh, <laughs> if, if I don't recognize you, uh, there's a reason for it. Uh, as Mike was, was uh, saying, we have uh, an exhibit, uh, well, we have a lot of exhibits upstairs, and hopefully if you haven't been here in the last uh, couple of months, uh, during the shutdown of the, because of the virus, we've been able to upgrade and uh, add to our exhibits. Uh, we have a new one we just put up this uh, past week about the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. And uh, hopefully you'll have a, an opportunity uh, after today, uh, today's talk to go upstairs and and check that out, and also check out our fallout shelter in our Cold War room. Um, I think you'll find that uh, of interest also. My talk today is about Colorado's contributions to victory in World War II, or how Colorado won the war. Uh, a lot of people don't realize the extent of what Colorado and Coloradans did to ensure victory in World War II. Uh, but to go back and give a little historical perspective, in 1931, uh, Japan started on its road to conquest in Asia, uh, invading uh, Manchuria and Korea and ultimately China. Uh, and in Europe, uh, a guy by the name of Adolf Hitler, you might have heard of him, uh, decided that, that he wanted to take over most, if not all, of Europe. And so uh, in September of 1939, he sent his forces into uh, Poland to take over that country. And uh, the next year, 1940, invaded much of Western Europe, uh, including France, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, and maybe a few other countries, uh, and was hoping to knock uh, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, out of the war before he started on his war against the Soviet Union. So there was war going on uh, on both sides of the globe. And uh, the United States 
finally got involved. We had had a neutrality uh, uh, stance. Uh, nobody really wanted to get into the war until Japan attacked Pearl Harbor on uh, December the 7th, 1941. And we had people from Colorado involved, as you will see in my show, from the very beginning of the war, or America's involvement in the war, from Pearl Harbor all the way to the very end of it. Uh, one of our local people, uh, Pete Peterson, was a sailor on the West Virginia when it was attacked on December 7th. Uh, luckily, uh, Pete survived the war. And interestingly enough, because uh, Colorado is landlocked, uh, we did not have any air, uh, naval bases or, or things that, that related to the sea. Uh, there were 20 other states that had some sort of coastal presence, uh, but not Colorado. And as a result, we didn't have shipyards that were building ships. Uh, we also did not have uh, large manufacturing operations such as uh, Boeing in Wichita, Kansas, and on the West Coast. Uh, so what did Colorado actually uh, contribute to the war? Well, we had uh, a number of uh, organizations and, and uh, commercial enterprises that helped out. One of them was the Denver Modification Center that uh, applied modifications to B-17s and B-29s out at uh, the old Stapleton Airport. Uh, and here you can see some of the, the B-17s lined up on the runway outside of the Modification Center. We had a number of other industrial contributions to the war. Uh, we had plenty of coal mines up in, uh, in coal country. There were at least eight underground mines in these following counties and also three service, surface mines uh, in a couple of other counties. Uh, a lot of this coal went to the CF&I Steel Company down in Pueblo. Uh, they were involved in a uh, number of activities, one of which was making barbed wire, and they also made pig iron ingots. Well, what, are, what were pig iron ingots? Uh, these were, uh, after they went through the smelting process, uh, turned into pure iron, which was then shipped to uh, manufacturing facilities uh, in the Midwest and further east, such as the uh, uh, tank factories in Detroit and Cleveland. We also had the Climax molybdenum mine. Don't ask me to say that twice because I'm only good for one pronunciation. Uh, this is up by Leadville. How many of you have ever visited uh, or driven by the molybdenum mine? See, I can't say it a second time. Uh, okay, about three of you. Uh, what was molybdenum? It was a substance used for the hardening of steel. So it was very, very important to the manufacturing process during the war. Uh, the manufacture of uh, guns, ships, uh, vehicles of all sorts. So this was a, a key industry here in Colorado. We are also a key uh, uh, producer of oil, uh, various uh, spots around, uh, around our state. Uh, there was the Gilman Eagle Mine where they extracted 10 million tons of things like zinc, gold, silver, copper, and lead, and it was in operation from 1886 into the 1960s. Uh, the, the town still exists on a ridge along Highway 24. If you're driving between Minturn and Leadville, you've probably seen this uh, abandoned ghost town sitting on this ridge. I always thought it'd be interesting when the family say, uh, Johnny, why don't you go out in the backyard and play today? They might never see Johnny again because uh, it's about a thousand foot drop or more down into the Eagle River Valley. We also had uh, at least one person involved in the Manhattan Project, the development of the atomic bomb. Uh, Philip Kuntz, who was a physicist at Colorado State University, uh, worked on the first nuclear-controlled uh, uh, reaction at the University of Chicago. Uh, the reactor was built under the uh, football stadium at the University of Chicago. Uh, also, Grand Junction, uh, has a, uh, a uranium mill there called Eurovan, uh, and uh, much of the uranium that went into our early nuclear weapons came out of uh, Eurovan. 
course, porcelain was also involved in the Manhattan Project. They were working on uh, producing high quality ceramic insulators that were used at the Oak Ridge uh, plant in Tennessee. Uh, and uh, that was quite the, uh, quite the operation as well. I should mention that I gave a portion of this talk uh, last month to a group of high rollers, some of the movers and shakers of Colorado. Um, I was sitting between Pete Coors and former Senator Hank Brown at this meeting, and there were a lot of other uh, high-powered uh, individuals who were at the meeting, and it was Pete Coors who, who uh, said, uh, you need to have a slide in there about what Coors Porcelain did uh, during the war, and I said, good point, I, I will do that. Uh, there was a, a small canvas company called the Schaefer Tenton Awning Company in Denver uh, who got a contract for uh, making these pyramidal tents and they were turning out 100 tents a day at their facility on South Broadway in Denver. There was another company in Denver called the Winter Weiss Company that was contracted to make trailers for the military. Uh, what do trucks and trailers uh, need? They need tires. So the Gates Rubber Company was involved in producing millions and millions of military tires. One of the reasons uh, that we had rationing during the war, and I'll talk about rationing in a moment, is the fact that uh, civilian tires were not available during the war. And so uh, people had to really conserve their tires because uh, everything else was going into military production. In Littleton, there was a company called the Coleman Motor Company that made uh, these truck-mounted uh, heavy-duty cranes that the military used, all branches of service used those. The Denver Ordnance Plant uh, was taken over by the Remington Arms Company, and they were producing something on the order of 10 million bullets a day. Um, the, after the war, the Remington Arms Denver Ordnance Plant was converted into the Federal Center at 6th and Kipling. You probably drive by that a lot and, and maybe didn't realize what the uh, wartime role was for that facility. Out on the east, east of the airport, uh, we had Rocky Mountain Arsenal that made napalm and poison gas. We used a lot of napalm. Fortunately, we didn't have to use the poison gas because our enemies chose not to use it as well but we had it in case you needed it. Probably our greatest resource was manpower. Uh, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, uh, thousands of young men from Colorado and millions from across the country went to their local recruiting stations and signed up uh, to volunteer for the armed services. The home front was also a very important part of the entire war effort, and we have devoted a room up in the museum to the home front and the contributions that were made. And some of those uh, revolved around women. Women were very important to uh, winning the war because so many men were off uh, in service that the jobs that were normally done by men were then filled by women. We had women uh, involved in uh, all sorts of activities, industrial activities, things like trucking, uh, working in the armaments factories uh, with so many young farm workers gone. The women took over much of the work in the farms. Uh, rationing was a big bone of contention for most Americans. Um, there was rationing of food. There was rationing, because of the rationing of food, there were uh, victory gardens that people planted in their backyards and sometimes their front yards just to have enough to supplement what they were allowed to buy at their grocery stores. Uh, there was rationing of shoe leather um, because most of the leather was going into military uh, use that people had to be creative about uh, how they uh, kept shoes on their feet. Probably the biggest uh, bone of contention was the gas rationing. Uh, most people were allowed three to five gallons a week and uh, you look at the cars there from the 1930s and 1940s, uh, you were lucky if you got 15 miles per gallon. So you didn't go very far on three to five gallons a week. There was a lot of uh, cheating, a lot of black market stuff that went on. 
there were uh, campaigns designed to let people know about how important it was for them to conserve, uh, to, to join carpools. I, I thought this was an effective poster. When you ride alone, you ride with Hitler. It kind of brings home that you're helping the enemy if you're not uh, conserving. Uh, a couple of uh, tire uh, posters uh, indicating the, the reason why you can't buy civilian tires on the market. Uh, the home front also, uh, especially children, got involved in things such as scrap drives. Uh, they would go around their neighborhoods and, and collect pots and pans or old used tires, uh, newspapers, magazines, chicken, uh, kitchen fat was, was welcome. Here are some more posters that talk about the, uh, the need for uh, conserving and, and recycling. Uh, war bond sales were also a big item uh, throughout the war. There are, I believe, seven major war bond drives uh, through the four years that we were involved in the war. This helped to finance uh, the purchase of uh, war material. Uh, the home front was also a sad time for many families when they had to say goodbye to their loved ones, not knowing if they would ever return. Uh, probably the, the people who suffered most on the home front were the Japanese Americans. Uh, in early 1942, there was a directive sent out by the government that relocated uh, Japanese-American citizens from the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, and even the West Coast of Canada had their own relocation program. Uh, and this meant that the Japanese-Americans, even though they were citizens, were told, you've got a week or two, sell your property, sell your business or just abandon it and, uh, and we will take you to these relocation camps which were, were basically concentration camps. We had a camp in southeastern Colorado called Camp Amachi, also known as the Granada Relocation Center. And this is where over 7,000 uh, Japanese Americans were kept for the duration of the war. Here you see some some of the Boy Scouts at the camp uh, saluting the American flag. It was kind of interesting that uh, because the, the uh, United States had really taken away their civil rights and uh, imprisoned them, uh, there was still a, a, a patriotic fervor among them. Uh, many of the young Japanese men wanted to show that they were uh, loyal citizens. Uh, Governor Ralph Carr uh, issued an edict that said that no uh, Japanese Americans in Colorado would be sent to a relocation camp. So it was all West Coast. And, and Carr was vilified by a segment of the population. He was not reelected to office. And yet today, the Ralph Carr Justice Center in, uh, Colorado, in, in downtown Denver uh, is named for him. And, and he has a, a statue and a monument to him at the uh, Sakura Square in downtown Denver because of his uh, support for Japanese American civil rights. Um, a number of the young Japanese Americans did decide that they wanted to, to fight for America. And so we see a group here being inducted. Uh, there were two men who were from Camp Amachi who received the Medal of Honor. George Sakata was one of them with the 442nd uh, in, uh, re, uh, Regiment of Japanese Americans, and his picture is in our Hall of Heroes of the uh, Medal of Honor recipients upstairs. Another young man, Kiyoshi Muranaga, uh, also received the Medal of Honor, but his was a posthumous award. He was, he was killed uh, performing the deeds that uh, brought him the Medal of Honor. We, Colorado also had POW camps across the country there were 700 of them, and there were 40 of them in Colorado. Here you see a, a picture of some of the German members of the Africa Corps who were uh, sent to uh, Colorado to help out uh, in, in the farm work. Uh, looks like they're harvesting uh, sugar beets there. The picture of the camp up there is at uh, Trinidad, Colorado. Uh, so we, we had uh, a few hundred uh, German soldiers who were imprisoned here during the course of the war. Uh, we also had a couple of ships that were named for Colorado cities. The battleship 
Colorado earned seven battle stars during the war, and the USS Denver, a cruiser, got 11 battle stars for its actions in the South Pacific. There were a number of military bases that uh, called Colorado home. Uh, Camp Carson down in Colorado Springs, Lowry Air Force Base on the Aurora-Denver border, and Camp Hale, where the 10th Mountain Division trained up by Leadville. There were also two other Air Force bases, Peterson Air Force Base and Buckley Air Force Base. The AAFB stands for Army Air Force Base because the Air Force was at that time not a separate uh, arm of the service, separate from the Army. Uh, at Fort Carson, there were 125 units that went through training there, including the 71st, 89th, and 104th Infantry Divisions. At Lowry, they trained bombers, the bombardiers, and uh, they had a big school for aerial photography. Uh, if you go upstairs, we have an exhibit of the Norden bomb site, and you'll see one of the aerial cameras there in, in addition to the Norden bomb site. That's a, a new addition to the museum. There were also a couple of other uh, spots uh, with military connection, Fort Logan, which was built in the 1880s, and Fitzsimmons Army Hospital, that was originally built to uh, treat servicemen wounded in World War I, but it became a major hospital uh, during the Second World War. Uh, in Golden, there was a place called Camp George West where the Colorado National Guard trained. And it's to, today, I think it's a, uh, um, not a penitentiary, but a, a place where criminals are are housed, it's kind of a, a low security facility. Uh, there were also the Tuskegee Airmen, the African American pilots. Uh, of course, segregation and discrimination was rampant um, even during World War II, uh, but there was a concerted effort to recruit African Americans for flight duty, and I've identified at least 10 or 12 men who had a, co a connection to Colorado who were a part of the Tuskegee Airmen Organization, had a fine combat record, uh, mostly flying over the skies of Italy. There were also two Army units that have a special connection to Colorado. One was the 157th Infantry Regiment, which was the Colorado National Guard, which was a part of the 45th Infantry Division, and the 10th Mountain Division, which is the, the more well-known of the two. Uh, talk a little bit here about the 157th uh, these, were, these were the ordinary guys, and I put ordinary in quotes because um, they were the guys who worked on the farms, worked in the mines, uh, worked uh, just you know, regular jobs. They were the regular Joes, I guess you could call them. Um, there, was, there was nothing glamorous about them. Uh, the two other regiments from, that made up the uh, 45th were there was about 3,000 Native Americans who were a part of that. So it was a very eclectic uh, uh, army unit of 14,000 men. Uh, the 10th Mountain was the exact opposite. These were the glamour boys. These were the kids who were on their, their college ski teams in the Ivy League schools. Uh, these were the, the kids from the rich families in, in the Northeast. Uh, there was also a, a large contingent of foreign-born skiers and mountaineers who joined the 10th uh, because they had come over from Europe uh, shortly before the outbreak of World War II, did not want to fight uh, in Hitler's armies or be uh, living under Nazi occupation. Uh, and we see uh, some of the activities here of uh, the rappelling down a uh, mountainside and, and learning how to, to fight and, and, uh, and survive on skis in the uh, high country. Uh, the, 10th Mountain Division got a lot of publicity because they had this glamour aura about them. Uh, they were featured in, in Life magazine on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. Uh, Warner Brothers even went to Camp Hale and made a movie called Mountain Fighters that used the, the entire division as extras in this film, which I have never seen. I would love to see the film, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, the men were, were superbly trained. They, they, uh, in the summertime, they, they climbed mountains. In the wintertime, 
They did all sorts of skiing activities. Uh, they were probably, other than maybe the, the rangers and the, the uh, special service force, uh, the most highly trained of, of the American Army units. Uh, this is my dad. He was a part of the 10th Mountain Division. Um, he learned to ski at Camp Hale and after the war took the skis home and never skied again. So <laughs> I guess he didn't like it very much. Um, the Army had a problem with what to do with the 10th because they were so specialized. Uh, there were not a whole lot of places they could be sent. And one of the issues was the fact that they had about 4,000 uh, pack mules and horses within the division because they needed those animals to take supplies uh, up into uh, mountain areas where trucks and jeeps and tanks couldn't go. So for over two years, the 10th Mountain Division sat at Camp Hale and did nothing but train as, as the war uh, seemingly passed them by. The Army just didn't have a, a role for them at that time. So going back a little bit to the 157th and what they accomplished uh, in World War II, uh, the 45th Division had 511 days of combat. They made four amphibious assault landings in the Mediterranean. They saved both the Salerno and the Anzio beachheads in Italy. They captured the city of Nuremberg. Uh, you may recall seeing pictures of the big Nazi stadium in Nuremberg, and there was this huge uh, swastika that was on top of uh, the main tribune of the uh, stadium. Well, it was the 45th Division engineers who blew the swastika up. Uh, that was one of their other claim to fame. And at the, near the end of the war, they liberated the Dachau concentration camp, and they took the city of Munich. Uh, here's a shot during the liberation of Dachau. These are some of the SS guards that have been rounded up by uh, the Colorado Regiment. Uh, here are some of the prisoners uh, being overjoyed at their release on April 29th of 1945. Uh, the battalion commander who led the 3rd Battalion of the 157th uh, was the first unit to reach Dachau was Felix Sparks. Um, Felix later became the commanding general of the Colorado Army National Guard a brigadier general. He served on the Colorado Supreme Court after he had become a lawyer and was, was one of the, the great figures in, in Colorado uh, military history. But the 45th Division, because they had had 511 days of combat, suffered heavy casualties, over 16,000 men. And you notice that uh, 12,000 men were in a division, but they had over 100% casualties. Uh, that was because as replacements came in, they got killed or wounded. And some soldiers were uh, wounded more than once. I know one fellow who I uh, talk about in my book, The Rock of Anzio, uh, a guy by the name of Veer Williams from Snyder, Colorado. He was wounded six times. The first five times he was returned to his unit after he recuperated, and the sixth time he... Uh, Say again? Tarzan. Tarzan, you got it. Uh, Tarzan. Veer Williams, quite the guy. The 10th Mountain Division, by contrast, had uh, very little time in combat. They were formed right before the outbreak of the war. Uh, they were the last American division to go into combat. And they had about four months uh, in combat from January until the beginning of May. But they never lost a battle, never gave up an inch of ground. They fought in Italy with the Fifth Army on a couple of occasions uh, into the northern Apennines and into the Po Valley and on towards the Alps. Uh, they were the spearhead of the entire Fifth Army uh, as they traveled through some of the war-torn areas of, of Italy. Uh, an interesting fellow, you may have heard of Darby's Rangers. Uh, William Darby was the founder and first commander of the uh, American Ranger uh, unit. And um, he was at Anzio with his uh, troops, and they were basically wiped out during an attack at, uh, at Anzio. Uh, and then he was transferred to the 45th Division. You see him wearing the Thunderbird patch here. And he became a regimental commander 
um, in the 45th. Well, then later, as the 10th Mountain Division was driving in northern Italy, uh, their assistant division commander was seriously wounded, and Darby was uh, placed in the position of, of assistant division commander. And two days before the end of the war, he was killed by a German shell. Uh, an incredible soldier uh, whose life was, was cut way too short. The 10th Mountain Division suffered their share of casualties as well, despite being in combat for such a short time, with 1,000 men killed and 4,000 wounded. This is a shot of the American Military Cemetery in Florence, Italy, where hundreds of uh, the 10th Mountain Division men uh, now lie. Uh, up at the top of Tennessee Pass, uh, close to Camp Hale, about 10 miles north of Leadville, is the 10th Mountain Division War Memorial. How many of you have ever visited the War Memorial? Kathy has. I know my wife has. Uh, it's a wonderful place to stop and contemplate the sacrifice because they have the names of all 1,000 men of, of the 10th who lost their lives in World War II. Post-war contributions were equally as important. I'll touch on those. Uh, many of the veterans came back to the States, and because they were top-notch skiers and mountaineers, they got into the, the ski resort business, I guess you could say. Uh, three of Vail's founders uh, are shown here, Pete Seibert, Bob Parker, and Sarge Brown. Uh, in Aspen, the Aspen Ski School is run almost entirely by 10th Mountain uh, veterans, Friedel Pfeiffer, who came from Austria uh, and served with the 10th, Percy Rideout, John Litchfield from New England. Uh, Fritz Benedict was an architect in Aspen, and he started the 10th Mountain Hut Association. Uh, there's a series of huts through the high country that, uh, that he started. Uh, other areas that were started, A Basin, started by Larry Jump and his wife Marnie. Uh, Rudy Schnackenberg uh, helped uh, run the steamboat ski area. And in fact, there were over 50 ski areas in the U.S. that had some in uh, 10th Mountain Division veteran involvement in their operation. Uh, there were other men of the 10th who were also uh, distinguished. Bill Bowerman, he was the University of Oregon track coach. He was a U.S. Olympic track coach in 1972 and was one of the founders of the Nike Corporation, a little company. I don't know if you've ever heard of Nike, but, but he did that. Uh, Paul Petzold uh, founded the National Outdoor Leadership Academy. Uh, people such as David Brower, who was president of the Sierra Club, Ben Duke, who was president of the Gates Rubber Company in Denver after the war, Merrill Hastings, who was the publisher of Skiing Magazine and also Colorado Magazine, uh, no longer in existence, but uh, they did their part. Bob Dole, probably the most famous of the 10th Mountain veterans, who uh, was the, Dem or the Republican presidential candidate in the 96 elections. He was a lieutenant, was seriously wounded. You may recall pictures seeing him on, on TV when he was running for president, that he would always hold a pen in his right hand and shake hands with his left, and that was because uh, his right hand was uh, and arm were so badly damaged that they were basically useless. There are a number of Coloradans who uh, were famous, are famous today, one of whom Byron Wizard White. You may have heard his name mentioned recently, uh, RGB or RBG. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg took his spot after he retired from the U.S. Supreme Court. He was a, a star athlete at the University of Colorado. Uh, he had been drafted by uh, the NFL uh, Detroit Lions, played a couple of seasons of professional football before um, he joined the Navy and was an intelligence officer in the Navy. Glenn Miller, uh, everybody knows Glenn Miller's music. Uh, he is from Fort Morgan, attended the University of Colorado. Uh, put together the Army Air Force Band that played uh, at uh, military bases around uh, Europe, uh, mostly in England. Um, lost his life flying over the English Channel when his plane mysteriously vanished. Uh, he was on his way to France to set up a concert in December of 44. 
Uh, two future governors of Colorado, John Love and John Vanderhoof, were naval aviators in World War II. Admiral Arlie Burke from, from uh, Boulder, uh, he did so much stuff I had to, I had to write it down because uh, it was more than I could memorize. Let's see, what did Arlie Burke do? He, uh, he distinguished himself in both World War II and Korea. He was char a hard-charging commander of destroyers, maybe Mike, your dad knew him. Uh, he was the chief of staff to Mark Mitcher's 5th Fleet Fast Carrier Task Force. He was a commander of Carrier Division 5 in Korea and uh, commander of naval operations um, with regard to nuclear submarines after the war. So he was a, had a quite a, a distinguished career. Uh, Lieutenant General Victor Krulak of the Marines uh, he saw action in World War II, Korea, Vietnam. He earned the Navy Cross for operations in the Solomon Islands where your dad's ship was sunk. Um, JFK, John F. Kennedy's PT-109 helped evacuate some of his men uh, after a mission on one of the islands in the Pacific. He was Chief of Staff of the 1st Marine Division in Korea and Commanding General of the Fleet Marine Force in 1964 in Vietnam. So again, uh, another uh, highly regarded uh, individual. Uh, General Maurice Rose was commander of the 3rd Armored Division in Europe and uh, he was killed about two days before, well, two months before the end of, of World War II. And uh, the Rose Medical Center in Denver was named in his honor. They have a an exhibit uh, about his career uh, there at the, the hospital as well. Uh, probably the most famous person with a connection to Colorado, even though he wasn't born in Colorado, he is a Coloradan by marriage, I call him. Um, he married Mamie Dowd, who was uh, a, a Denver girl. Uh, this is a picture from their wedding in uh, 1916. Ike had graduated from the uh, West Point uh, Military Academy, and there's a, in the hallway here, you may have seen all the posters about Ike's life and his connection to Colorado. Um, he uh, was the Supreme Allied Commander of the uh, operation to liberate Europe, uh, the uh, Normandy invasion and, and everything that, that came after that. Uh, after the war, he was uh, elected president for two terms. Uh, he called Denver his summer White House and would stay at the Dowd House in Capitol Hill and, and uh, had his offices at Lowry Air Force Base. Uh, he was, uh, you know, quite, quite the, uh, the personality, uh, you might say. Well, both uh, Dwight and Mamie were here. Oh, yeah, that's right. In 1963, when this was the Broomfield uh, Library, and there's a picture of, of them up, uh, I think it's maybe out here in the hall as well as upstairs, at the dedication of this building, uh, which is now the museum. So that's a, that's a great connection. Thank you, Mike. We also had a, at least one Coloradan involved in the Doolittle Raid six months after, well, five months after the Pearl Harbor attack, where we sent uh, the carrier Hornet into the Pacific about 600 miles from Japan and launched these B-25 bombers. Uh, this is Mike Fellow's father's destroyer back here, the USS Gwynn, uh, that was uh, on convoy escort duty for this raid. Uh, and uh, the gentleman here on the left, Harry McCool from La Junta, was the navigator on one of the, uh, I believe it was 16 uh, B-25s that took part in that operation where they bombed Japan and then flew on and crash landed in China, some of them. Uh, we also had a Coloradan involved in the uh, nuclear attack on Hiroshima. Uh, he was uh, aboard the Enola Gay. He's in the arrow here, his name is Bob Caron. Uh, he's got a Brooklyn Dodgers cap on because he was originally from Brooklyn, uh, but moved to Denver after the war. He was the tail gunner on this B-29 on this historic mission. Um, and this is part of what I had put together for my talk to the, the, uh, the bigwigs uh, uh, last month. 
because I wanted to do a commercial uh, for the museum here. Um, and so here's a shot of, of the front of the building. Here's Mamie, here's Ike. And uh, she must have said something funny because people are laughing uh, uh, rather uh, uproariously there. Um, and as you go through the building, you see the sign here. It says, where the heroes live on. And that's what we try to do here is to pay homage to the veterans uh, from Colorado who have served their country since the Civil War to the present day. Uh, some shots of the interior and exterior of the museum, our wonderful library over here, and our wonderful librarian who keeps it all in, uh, in fine order. We may have messed up a few books yesterday. So. <laughs> Um, and and we, we start with the Civil War because Colorado was involved in the Civil War. A lot of people don't realize that we have that connection. Uh, we go through uh, the frontier forts, the Spanish-American War, uh, the First World War. Here's a shot of our new exhibit on uh, the 75th anniversary, the end of, of World War II. Uh, we, get, we, we devote five whole rooms to World War II because it was such a, a, uh, an auspicious uh, event in world history. Uh, there, we have a souvenir medallion that was taken from Mussolini's villa by a member of the 10th Mountain Division uh, when they raided uh, his villa along Lake Garda there, Villa Feltrinelli. Um, some people coming into our uh, European theater room, our 10th Mountain exhibit, our 45th Division exhibit. Um, D-Day, uh, we had people involved in that, uh, at least four people that I know of, and, and I'm sure there are hundreds more. Uh, Will Staub, who was a Coast Guardsman who drove a, a landing craft to the beachhead uh, on D-Day. Um, uh, Airman Helps, who was shot down over Normandy and lost his life there. Uh, Bob Rudzinski, who was a Navy corpsman who treated casualties on Utah Beach on D-Day. Bob Hilbert, who was a member of the 1st Infantry Division uh, that landed at Omaha Beach on D-Day. We also devote uh, an entire room to women in uniform because uh, they did such an important job, uh, not only on the home front, but also when they were serving as nurses in combat areas. So we wanted to make sure that they were recognized for their contributions. We talk about a number of Colorado women who were uh, a part of this whole effort, such as Lila Morrison, who was an Army nurse uh, who treated casualties uh, after the Battle of the Bulge and was one of the first medical people into the Buchenwald concentration camp uh, at, uh, near the end of the war. Uh, we talk about Paul Murphy, a local man who was a sailor aboard the cruiser of the USS Indianapolis. The Indianapolis had just delivered components of the atomic bomb that was going to be dropped on Hiroshima and was on its way back unescorted. Uh, it was kind of a secret mission. Nobody really knew where the Indianapolis was. Uh, they were attacked by a uh, Japanese submarine, put a torpedo or two into the Indianapolis and began sink sinking immediately. There were over 1,100 men on board. Um, 317, I believe, uh, were able to get off, and they're floating in the water for, five, for four days. Uh, nobody knows that the Indianapolis has gone down. Uh, they, were, they were out of radio contact. Uh, sharks were attacking the men in the water and killing them. Uh, a Navy PBY just happened to be flying patrol over that area, and he noticed a an oil slick in the water and went down to take a closer look and saw all these heads bobbing in the water and the guys are waving at the, at the uh, aircraft. And so the aircraft landed, radioed what he had found back to his base and the Navy started sending ships and planes to rescue those who were in the water and, and Paul Murphy was one of those who was rescued. He's, he died just, what, four years ago, something like that? Incredible story. Another story that we tell here is about Clayton Decker from Paonia, Colorado. He was a sailor on board the USS Tang, which is one of the highest scoring submarines in the Navy. And uh, they were on a, on a war patrol and they were, they had found a Japanese convoy and they were sending torpedoes out. 
they were sinking the Japanese ships. And the uh, submarines at that time had 24 torpedoes. And the 24th one, they shot out, malfunctioned, and circled back and struck the submarine. And the uh, submarine had 80 plus men on board. I believe eight of them were, were able to escape, and Clay Decker was one of those who got out uh, using what we have on display here called a Momsen lung. Uh, it's a rebreather device, uh, kind of an early scuba uh, type of uh, uh, device that allows you to uh, breathe underwater, and he was able to come to the surface. Well, who's on the surface? The Japanese that they're trying to kill. And so he's taken prisoner along with the other seven members of the of the Tang and put in Japanese uh, prisoner war camps where they're tortured and beaten. And this was a shot taken on the day that his camp was liberated. And we see him there with the, the arrow. Uh, it's kind of a sad story that, that his wife uh, had received a telegram from the War Department saying that the Tang had been sunk and that uh, Clay was lost, presumed dead. She gets remarried and he comes back to Colorado and she says, hi, honey, I'm home. And she, she says, well, I have some bad news for you. I got remarried. Um, but then he was remarried and, and uh, had a very happy life uh, for the rest of, of his life. But it's another one of the veteran stories that we tell in the museum. As I mentioned earlier, we have stories of the 26 men with a connection to Colorado who received the Medal of Honor in our upstairs hallway. Another uh, Medal of Honor recipient was Joe Martinez. You may have seen his statue uh, in the park in front of the state capitol. Uh, and and uh, he lost his life uh, in the performance of his duties. VE Day came on May 8, 1945, when the Germans surrendered. Uh, a lot of happiness. Uh, there was a great deal of, of joy in Colorado, uh, celebrations in all of the major cities and probably most of the small towns too. VJ Day, Victory Over Japan, took place on September 2nd, 1945. One of the people on board the USS Missouri was Clyde Brunner. Clyde Brunner was the second mayor of Broomfield. And so, as I said at the beginning, we have people from the start of the war at Pearl Harbor to Clyde Bruner at the end of the war. The men overseas uh, started coming home. Uh, for many of them, it was a very joyous reunion. But we have to also look at the human cost of victory. There were 407,000 Americans who died on all fronts in World War II, including 2,700 Coloradans. We must never forget their sacrifice. And that's why we say at the entrance to the museum, the Broomfield Veterans Museum, where the heroes live on. Thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you. Are there any questions for tonight? Any questions? Yes. Um, I said that VJ Day stands for the Victor Robert Japan. What is VJ? Victory in Europe. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've heard of both of those, but I never knew what they were. So no. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the, the farther we get away from a historical event, you know, the, the less familiar it becomes to people. It's amazing when we get grade school kids here, you know, if they've even heard of World War II, it's amazing. And we, we open their eyes to, you know, all that has gone on before because they're in such, you know, they're little worlds that, uh, you know, anything beyond that is, you know, we might as well be talking about the, the history of the solar system. Well, the big thing, too, from our generation, there were uncles, parents, you know, immediate people who had mm -hmm. served in the war, so mm -hmm. you heard their stories. And now it's great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, so, uh, yeah, we get further and further from these events. There's a hand back here. Yes, sir. I was wondering about what year Camp Carson were changed to Fort Carson. Uh, Camp Carson remained that until after the war, but I don't know the exact uh, year that that took, took place. I lived near Fort Carson for a while. I had a house. Okay. Hills, I know where that is. I was stationed there my last year in the Army. Yep. Yes, sir. Uh, you didn't mention 
mention it, that probably everybody knows, but um, there is a memorial at the Noonan Library for the Indianapolis. Here at Broomfield, yes. okay. Yeah, I did not mention that. But I will add that to my next, the next time I do this show, I'll add that. Yeah, Dave? I worked at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal for about 13 years. And uh, when I was there, I learned that the bombs that were dropped on Tokyo just prior to the, the atomic bombs, uh, probably 90, 95% of those were made at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Ah, interesting. Cool. Interesting. Other questions or comments? Well, you've been a great audience, and I, I thank you so much. And I guess, Mike, you'll wrap it up? Yeah. Well, thank you, Flint. Uh, and again, for all of you, thank you very much for coming and joining us with this. Uh, this is, Flint was our 190th uh, Coffee and Conversation. And again, <laughs> all of them have just been amazing. And it, it's so important that we do capture and learn from the stories of our people who have served in, in our military, and even those who are just wanting to tell the story of a parent or some other important thing that we all think we should know. Uh, again, I apologize I'm with the initial mess up we had electronically <laughs> to start. If anything's ever going to get messed up, it, it's with the electronics. <laughs> uh, but in any event, please stick around. Again, enjoy coffee and, and more donuts. We got plenty. And please visit the other parts of the museum uh, which Flint gave you a marvelous tour of. And so many new exhibits here, it's just changed tremendously over the last year. And again, the credit all goes to this guy here. No, I've got a great ideas. committee, Dave Jamiel yeah. and, and Lou uh, Roman and Mitch. Everybody does their part. It's a team effort. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so again, thank you very much. and. Uh, Please enjoy the rest of your day. Stay healthy. Wash your hands. Wear your mask. And we'll be next time.